So I welcome you all again. Um, this is the International Tribunal of Natural Justice. And as I've said on many occasions before, uh, the words are very simple. And those are the ones that we, we abide by. Uh, we don't embellish them and we stick to them. The words natural justice. We look at the word natural, it's that which is around us and which is us, um, unembellished, not fabricated. Even the word fabrication suggests not that something's just made, but that it's a lie. So what we look to is for us to speak to each other from ourselves. And we look also to the word justice. Justice is a very simple word, it's just is. And that's what we are doing here today. We're not here to judge, we're just here to listen and to hear. And you are here today to give your testimony. Um, and to begin that, you begin with an oath. So if you can say your oath, which is your truth, and the truth you're gonna give us today. Uh, I swear that everything I'm saying is true, correct, complete and accurate, or at least as complete as I, I know. Uh, so help me God. Very good, thank you very much. And now if you now begin, uh, tell us uh, your testimony, and, and, and to give us your truth. Okay, thank you. Uh, greetings to all ITNJ commissioners, for and on the record. This testimony is given in good faith and goodwill and serves as notice to the world and is true, correct, and certain. I, Kiri Mae Burnor, am of the age of majority, a private American national of the United States of America, non-enemy, daughter of Most High and friend of this court. My profession is consultant and program architect, and I testify as follows for the sake of all mankind. Introduction. My story reflects the intention of human trafficking and genocide for all mankind by the dark side for being tethered to AI systems, experiments, torture, etc., wherein the ultimate objective is to network the biological systems of man with a system of artificial intelligence reducing humanity to a totally controllable status. This is being accomplished through many different programs, operations, and applications that attack mankind's environment. Food we eat. The food we eat, the products we use, and the information systems we are exposed to. In my case, the use of military-grade nanotechnology as a seaburn, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear weapon, was used with efforts to kill me 10 times, nine of which were physical and the subsequent were attacks, uh, were threats. I have survived these attacks by the grace of God through living in hiding since 2013. Prior to 2013, I was living under aliases. And uh, 2013, I was actively in hiding and on the run until Donald J. Trump took office in late of 2016. My story is voluminous, so I will reference several links to my website and radio shows, etc. I hope that my story can be a beacon of hope for those who feel there is no chance against these weaponized technologies. Love is the only way out. I will include reports that evidence before and after tests revealing a total turnaround in results with regards to being healed of the effects of weaponized nanotechnology. Another report confirms that I'm no longer emitting any signals after the before report by a private investigator clearly indicated that signals were emitting from my body due to the nanomaterials having been activated. I am healed and continue to heal in the aftermath of subsequent attacks that followed my first triumph over this technology. I do not know of anyone who has been involved in a program like this who is free, and so I feel an urgency to let others know there is in fact a way out. Summary of history. I, Kiri Mae Bernor, am a former Catholic nun. Evidence was presented to the ITNJ, and I'm going to do it again. This is the evidence that one would collect to verify if someone had served as a Roman Catholic sister or nun in the diocese. So these clippings came from the diocesan directory. I'll do what I can to get it in the camera. So this is in the year 1998 to 1999, and that's the Catholic Free Press. And this is where it was held at the library in the Worcester Library. 
And what we're going to do is get my name up closer to the camera. It's Sister Benjamin Bernor. So when you're looking for it, it's not going to be under Kiri. It's going to be under Benjamin Bernor. M-I-C-M -M stands for Mancipia Immaculatis Cordis Maria, which means the, 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 uh, the slave of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And that's the location where the convent was. So I'm actually featured in this directory twice, but for you know simplicity's sake, that's what we'll provide for the record. And of course, a photograph of the time when I was a hermit at St. Joseph's Abbey as in the seeking the canonical status to under Canon 603. So I was being trained there at St. Joseph's Abbey uh, under that provision according to Canon law. Okay. And uh, so I am a former Catholic nun and am a victim survivor of sexual abuse, clergy sexual abuse, by a member of the monastic clergy at a renowned monastery named St. Joseph's Abbey in Spencer, Massachusetts. Having served in the Roman Catholic Church as a sister at St. Anne's House, St. Benedict Center, Still River, Massachusetts from 1993 to 1998, I then entered into candidacy for the Eremitic, or also known as the Hermit Life, by canon law under, canonically under the Bishop of Worcester, Massachusetts, and was given the spiritual accompaniment or spiritual direction of priests of St. Joseph's Abbey until 2001. It was in August of 2001 that I was sexually assaulted by Father Joseph Chukong of the order of St. Joseph's Abbey, uh, the Cistercian order. In 2003, the priest was acquitted, docket number 0269CR001118, March 13, 2003, due to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts attorney throwing the case. C. Bernor Abbey seeks peace after trial, Monk found not guilty after North Brookfield woman filed suit, April 16, 2003, Spencer New Leader, and you can get that at clergyvictim.com backslash articles, HTML. Note. The communications director, the communications director, his name is Father Edward John Mullaney for St. Joseph's Abbey, is quoted in this news article as saying, I can say that we forgive her just as she said in her letter that she forgives us. Mullaney was quoting from my letter to the editor, Bernor saddened by trial results, April 2nd, 2003 of the Spencer New Leader, wherein I stated to them, to the Abbey, I forgive you, Father Joseph, for what you did to me and for not being strong enough to serve God first. Father Isaac, I forgive you for becoming an obstacle to the truth. Father Abbot Damien Carr, I forgive you for your lack of filial love and lack of paternal responsibility regarding the care of Father Joseph's soul, which I hoped for and expected from you. I'll always love and pray for St. Joseph's Abbey. In 2006, I participated in a rally and testified before the Judiciary Committee at the State House in Boston, Massachusetts. After this rally, I was approached by attorney John Stobierski, who asked me to provide evidence for cases relating to victims he was representing against Father Edward John Mullaney of this same monastery in Spencer, St. Joseph's Abbey, who was a monk priest, where I was actually sexually assaulted. This Father Edward John Mullaney served as communications director. Father Edward John Mullaney is reported to have used the confessional as a means to gather information on vulnerable souls to determine if they were damaged goods for having been abused in their childhood. He would utilize this vulnerability to later pose as a healing presence to them. He is known to be a serial offender of multiple vulnerable adults who were in fact abused in their pasts. He was reported to have subjected victims to what I would call satanic rituals requiring urine, menstrual blood, bodily fluids to slake his sexual appetites. Meanwhile, the Abbey covered it up, paying victims off rather than addressing the cause. At this time, I was helping victims and served as a private advocate for victims, survivors of clergy abuse. I joined Survivors Network for Those Abused by Priests, SNAP, and privately assisted in high profile investigations alongside a Mary T. Jean, who is a victim advocate who headed the WisterVoice.com at the time. Mary T. Jean is also, was also instrumental in exposing corruption at the top, even to implicating the Vatican in Massachusetts state politics via the Conti Mafia, previous district attorney in Worcester, Massachusetts. 
Ms. Jean was granted a restraining order by the federal court against the Worcester DA and all state police after she experienced retaliation from them for her assistance to victims of clergy sexual abuse. I served in negotiations with District Attorney of Worcester, Massachusetts, Joseph Early Jr. on cases like the Father John Zantar case and investigated several others until 2008. See Spotlight the movie. I helped expose by, the, by name the players at the top and proved that the agenda was not only sexual abuse, but social engineering for the destruction of America ultimately to mass genocide. Please reference the October 17, 2007 interview with Greg Szymanski on libertyradiolive.com. And it's also featured on my website, clergyvictim.com under the interviews tab. Greg also interviewed me with guest Jonathan Levy, barrister and attorney on July 17, 2009, during which we both exposed on Greg's show, The Investigative Journal, the Vatican's dis design to destroy America via the blueprint for wholesale slaughter and genocide as described in the Alpern versus Vatican Bank case. Levy represented the victims of plunder and genocide in Serbia, where over 700,000 Serbians were killed during war as a sacrifice of souls. I'm going to also share with you a chart that came from Strunk versus the New York Province of the Society of Jesus et al. DCD, page 31 and 33, PDF supplied to the ITNJ, and to the eradication of the Orthodox Christians who do not submit to the Pope's temporal or spiritual power. Here's the case where this chart comes from. Do what I can to get it in the camera. So that's a real, a real court case that was filed. And the actual chart indicates five concentration camps laid on, upon ley lines within the configuration of a pentagram. This is Germany and this is Poland, etc. So this is just to illustrate that there is an evil design behind the sacrifice of souls through war, okay? The extermination plan, as outlined, and this comes from combatgenocide.org, in May 1941, the Ustashi organization declared their three goals. One, a third of the Serbian population in the independent state of Croatia, NDH, were to be forcibly converted to Roman Catholicism. Two, a third of the Serbian population in Croatia were to be deported. Three, a third of the Serbian population in Croatia were to be killed. I converted to... to Orthodox Christianity in 2008, as did also attorney Jonathan Levy. I exposed the Jesuit agenda, which is to wipe out any resistance to the Pope and his military order via the Jesuits themselves and to wipe out all nations worldwide capable of fighting the Vatican. I saw similar parallels and designs as revealed by Kay Griggs, the wife of a military Illuminati insider, Colonel George R. Griggs, who disclosed how the Jesuits infiltrated all of the United States armed forces and government. So later I exposed it on radio, on my website, and in 2015 via my notice to the world, which will be referenced below, and is also incorporated as though fully stated herein. I was beside myself when I realized that the religious habit I donned subsequent to my conversion to the Roman Catholic Church in 1993, and as a part of my service within Jesuitism, and the Cistercian spirituality. Cistercians are the modern Knights Templar was nothing different than an SS uniform. In 2008, I left the Roman Catholic Church and formally denounced it by declaration in 2015 by way of a formal release, which was sent to the Vatican and other officials, copy of release attached and supplied to the ITNJ. Notice, I do not advocate hatred or prejudice against any Roman Catholics. Many of them truly love the Lord and are not aware of how Vatican politics operate. I became aware from a source within the diocesan chancery with whom I had formed a friendship that I was under 24 seven surveillance. And that after the October 2007 interview with Greg Szymanski, Sister Paula Kelleher served as vicars for religious women in the diocese of Worcester, Massachusetts at that time. Following my departure from the Roman Catholic Church in 2008, my subsequent conversion to orthodoxy, a radio interview exposing more about the Abbey in response to a victim survivor's turmoil over Father Edward John Mullaney being accepted back into St. Joseph's Abbey, 
reference Sister Curie and Mosiah fighting evil on a spiritual level, one of two, December 4th, uh, 4th 2008, that's on my interviews tab on clergyvictim.com. I also exposed St. Joseph's Abbey's founder, J. Peter Grace, who is known as the father of MK Ultra, Mind Control Ultra, who is buried on the grounds at St. Joseph's Abbey. I sensed my life was at risk and decided to move away and live a quiet life in Texas, January of 2009, leaving all of this behind. For my story up until 2008, you may download the PDF book, which is free for now. It's called Divine Challenge, and you can get that at the um, clergyvictim.com backslash divine challenge. Um, it's probably about 350 pages. This is all also annexed to this testimony. Targeted evidence gathered. In two 2009, I began to study private law and realized many successes. I was able to assist in the release of two people, one in jail and the other in prison, using these methods and was interviewed by FBI in 2012 of April, after which they sought to hire me as a CHS or a CI due to my unique knowledge in private banking and other related fields. It was during that interview that I was asked if I believed if, if we are all owned by the Pope through the collateralization of our birth certificates. I avoided the question. Evidence furnished to the ITNJ. After experiencing vertigo and other sinus issues, I underwent surgery in 2011, only to find in December of 2012, upon examination by a private investigator proficient with TSCM, Technical Surveillance Countermeasures, there were, in fact, foreign materials emitting signals in my body. All is documented and verified by multiple qualified sources. Upon visiting a toxicologist and undergoing multiple tests, for instance, Raymond spectroscopy, FTIR, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, etc. The materials from my body that were sampled were indeed a military grade weaponized form of nanotechnology. All reports are verified, samples with chain of custody at labs, all evidence is interpreted by the only known expert on nanotechnology, having access to a CLIA lab, clinical laboratory improvement amendments, open to civilians at the time, as far as I understand, and was apprised by Dr. Hildegard Stanninger herself. Although that was the first, there have been altogether several attempts, nine physical attempts and other threats against my life to date using biochemical radiological nuclear materials. Yes, weapons of mass destruction, nanomaterials, and military grade sound weapons were deployed against me. All information was furnished to this commission. In Ju July 2015, I posted a notice to the World Bernal's criminal report on the internet and sent or faxed the same report to the commander in chief who was Obama at the time, every congressman, senator and representative in addition to many world leaders, the judge's advocacy general, the Department of Defense, chief of naval operations, the fake news medias like CNN, etc and other alternative media, including Alex Jones, etc. And thank God I sent it to Donald J. Trump, who later became president. See link here, and I provide the link to the, to the World Crime Report. Um, notary certificates of service attached, also provided to the ITNJ, said notice to the world, with 10 and 412 pages attached here, here too. Uh, attached here to also is the updated timeline produced to the ITNJ Commission regarding timeline of 10 attempts and threats on my life with eight pages. For the sake of clarity, I'll review this executive summary after giving a more thorough review of the first and most well-documented nano weapons attack. Some may ask how I came to have access to people with clearances. I was on Greg Szymanski's A Journalist arcticbeacon.com show back in 2007 and have connected with several other whistleblowers and radio personalities, including Eric John Phelps, the author of Vatican Assassins, Chris Strunk, Leo and Leo Zagami. Zagami is a former high-ranking official of the P2 Lodge with inside access. I had continued access to his security team. Leo Zagami, former Illuminati, called me at the suggestion of Greg Szymanski in 2008 to assist him with formulating new constitutions and ceremonial writings with the purpose of intimately 
of ultimately freeing these souls who wanted to be free of demonic attachment as a result of taking the advanced oaths in Freemasonry. My proposed involvement stemmed from my ecclesiastical background and familiarity with Latin. Zagami, in turn, has offered me much insight into the inner workings of the Jesuits, the Vatican, and the other orders. See his expose of the Vatican here, and I provide the link to the show where he discusses this Vatican, demonic possession of the Vatican exposed, Leo Zagami, interview with Alex Jones. Let us now turn our attention to the following excerpt from a report written by Dr. Benjamin Colison, PhD in psychology with date 620, 2016. I later felt it would be important to get this test done. I did not disclose the report until absolutely necessary. And so it was published to my website at the tab called nanotechnology used in efforts to silence whistleblower. In 2016, after I was threatened to either be put in an asylum or to be framed for a crime if I chose not to join a certain program that was offered to me by a deep state operative. And this individual also threatened my life. This documents relating to this were provided to the ITNJ. This report, Psychological Evaluation of Kerry Bernard, 620, 2016 by Benjamin Colson, PhD, in full is provided also to the ITNJ. On pages 19 through 23, it reads regarding SCADA related medical records, it says the following, December 13th, 2012, Frequency Testing Report, Melinda Kidder, Private Investigator, Columbia Investigations, Columbia, Missouri, abnormal ELF EMF frequencies detected at neck and abdomen, unexplained 0.5 millimeter scar detected at the jawline under UV exam, presence of ambient radio frequencies detected pages three through four. 116, 2013, Toxological Evaluation Report by Dr. Hildegard Staninger reflects Ms. Verna was exposed to advanced nanomaterials. On page eight, her current symptoms are all related to the neurological exposures to the heavy metals detected, but also to the interaction of EMF and self-generating frequency signals as identified in the Columbia Investigations Report dated 12-13-2012. 119, okay, that's just other clinical test data. 12, 123, 13, Toxicological Dysfunction Analysis Report by Dr. Hildegard Staninger. Findings, exposure to phenol confirmed. Discussion, phenol is a metabolite of benzene. Benzene is known to cause leukemia in humans and is not a normal component of blood or urine. The level should be none detected and any exposure that expre is expressed in urine is indicative of a parent compound being metabolized and stuck in the kidney. In some cases of biosensory technology, phenol may be the metabolite of this of thin film technology with a waveguide of specific compounds for detection purposes. Further inve investigation will have to occur in this matter as additional test results data is reviewed. 4-8-2013. Industrial Toxicological P Comparative Report on Emission of Frequency Signals from the Human Body and Previous Chemical Analysis of Mesogenic Biosensors, Dr. Hildegard Stanberg. Summary, frequencies emitted by Ms. Berno identified as per the allocation by Federal Communications Commission correlated with frequencies allocated to U.S. military operations. Discussion. The frequencies found to be emitting from Ms. Kerry Bernal on December 13, 2012, were from one specific location, but with smaller traveling frequency that was in a smaller range within the signals. The chemical composition of the specimens taken from Ms. Bernal's scalp and other areas may be designed for two different regional broadcasts, one for direction or action function upon the body and one for monitoring the location or specific areas of her body. Both ranges are monitored by geosatellite, page four. 530, 2013, Advanced Material Analysis Report for Origin of Specimen Chemical Analysis, Mesogenic Biosensory Advanced Materials. It's three o'clock. H. Uh, Hildegard Staniger, and the, it says here, photo micrographs of the various specimens submitted for analysis are attached to this report. Conclusional summary. The majority of high impact technologies that utilize brain computer in interfaces as a neural net, neural tree network, brain chip, or biosensor would be for the following purposes. 
Control and monitoring of the brain and bodily functions. Control and monitoring of the behavior of the individual. Sending and receiving verbal commands. Stimulation of the bioelectrical transmissions within the neuron trees of the nerves. May be utilized as a listening device for remote sensing and monitoring. May be used as a transmitter for listening in on conversations. If there is a digital computer computer component to the device, it may be used to capture visual transmissions as a walking, talking monitoring system, a high-tech extrinsic spying system, especially for military industrial espionage. Now I'm going to show you just some visuals of the specimens that were taken from my body. So that you can see during the purification process when I was cleaning myself out over a period of several months, these things, I took them out and I, put, I, I sent them through the chain of custody to the lab and the findings are that they are not of human origin. So these are the specimens that are still uh, at the lab um, safely under lock and key. It says further on the same, uh, report private development specifically monitoring genetic material or for the identi identity of specific genetic bloodlines. So obviously they had an interest in monitoring my genetics. Now we're, get to, we're getting to the good part here. Success, approximately five and a half months later, 6-1-2013 frequency testing report, Melinda Kidder, private investigator, Columbia Investigations, Columbia, Missouri. Ambient RFID signals detected in Ms. Berner's presence and not detected in her absence. A CECO uh, radio frequency signals were not emanating from Berner, but to her. So this is a good sign because in the previous report, the signals were emanating from my body to the environment. The ELF EMF readings were in normal range with single exception at su superior lateral tuberosity of the humerus. So basically, this is a success story, and I, we rejoiced over that. Um, 7 2013 retesting specific biological monitoring test exposure to advanced nanomaterials, Dr. Hildegard Staniger. Retesting through advanced biological monitoring tests were performed on Ms. Bernor. 4 2013 testing involved specific tests that were positive in the original testing of 1 2013 The report continues. Open quote, the tests show a total turnaround in response to the outlined recommended treatments therapies for exposure to advanced nanomaterials and biosensor devices. All values are well within acceptable ranges and patient client has not experienced symptoms as previously described in earlier reports. The, the, this was a moment to rejoice. I was able to get through that experience. The only problem was I ended up getting reseated with uh, other subsequent attacks. So I was re-exposed about a year later with a series of subsequent attacks listed by chronology in series of subsequent attacks in the timeline, 10 attempts and threats on my life to date. Now I'm going to proceed to um, moving forward because this, there's so much volume to my story. So I just want to get straight into the, the photographs of another attack that happened subsequent to my healing. And this, this is the, um, in February of 2015, my car interior was sprayed with smart dust, confirmed with patch test, red Subaru in open garage. So this is a picture of, now we'll do the best we can to get this in the camera. All right. So basically there's a fluorescent green dye that I ended up finding on the carpet um, in, this, in the car. So I had cut out that material and sent it to the lab because when the Subaru was broken into, only the two bags of quarters were stolen, but the valuables were not stolen. So I felt an, uh, an inclination to look under blue light because I had obtained uh, all this equipment just in case something like this happened to me again. And so I'm going to read to you the findings that are related to this carpet having been cut out and sent to the lab. The report, 6-19-2015. 
Report on exposure to designer innovative nanotechnology. The assessment area is the vehicle and living facility. Dr. Hildegard Staniger. Introduction. On or about February 26, 2015, our client, Ms. Carrie Berner, had a break into her vehicle, which was reported to private investigators for safety concerns, and a collection of the samples were submitted to them. The areas of the samples collected were viewed under UV light to determine if there was any, was present any dye from quantum nanodots or other stress factors which may be utilized in the architecture of an innovative nanotechnology delivery system for designer type toxins with a specific intent toward our client. After reviewing the analytical data from the various testing, it was determined that the living area home carpet did not contain any innovative nanotechnology and or toxins. However, the red container number one, which contained carpet material from the suspect vehicle was positive for nanowires. Nanowires may be designed to contain fungus residue, mycotoxins, specific tags, antibodies, KB proteins, metals, and other toxic substances. The client did have a patch test analysis and hair analysis with further analysis for DT tomato panel Fox M1 protein and advanced nanomaterials. The analysis revealed specific materials that would induce colon cancer, breast cancer, and leukemia with a pair of FRET partners in fluorescent pair and neurosphere zirconium arsenate with insect venom, paspain, and versicolin A and viridotoxin each used as a specific tag to induce and or monitor cancer mechanisms development. The analysis results indicate that the materials utilized were of a specific innovative nanotechnology delivery system with a specific intent, such as to give our client cancer at an accelerated rate of time. Now we're going to go into the mental status examination by Dr. Kolodzin, Benjamin Kolodzin. Ms. Berner was interviewed 6-2-2016 for mental status and was punctual for her appointment. She was cooperative and appeared honest and open to all questions asked. She appeared to be of above an average intelligence, which was congruent with her educational and professional history. Ms. Berner was oriented to date, time, place, and others. She answered all questions of brief mental status examination correctly in a coherent and timely manner. Pressure of speech was absent and she reported her symptoms and elements of her life history. Ms. Bernal reported no current psychiatric medications, no recreational drug use, no history of head traumas, no history of felony convictions, no military service, no recent surgery, and no history of involuntary stays in mental facilities. She did report a series of traumatic incidents beginning in 2001 and ongoing to the present time and a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder in 2006. She was also interviewed using the post-traumatic stress checklist self-report measure and scored high on this instrument. She also reported known exposures to toxic heavy metals via nanotech exposures, exposures to microwave radiation and other directed energy phenomena, and reported her November 2011 nasal surgery as the suspected source of original implantation of advanced foreign, mer foreign materials. She said her highest experience pain level during these experiences was a 10 on a zero to 10 rating scale. Ms. Berner reported difficulties with sleeping and perception and difficulties with memory and concentration. She reported no family history of diagnosed mental illness. She did report that during childhood, she experienced chronic family disturbances due to parental alcoholism and neglect. She described in a coherent manner her belief that some types of advanced technologies had been embedded in or otherwise directed at her without consent and were causing her physical and cognitive symptoms. Although this type of belief is commonly classified as delusional and a red flag, red flag pointing toward cognitive aberration, in Ms. Bernor's case, at the time of the interview, she also presented confirming physical evidence that in fact, markers of advanced nanotechnology are present in her body for which she had given no consent and that frequency signals detectable at her body surface appeared to be in communication with an advanced SCADA system, supervisory control acquisition data, et cetera, CH SCADA re records review. Due to the presence of this measurable and verifiable physical evidence, Ms. Bernard's claims of being a targeted individual who has experienced 
some external manipulations were treated as potentially authentic and not delusional. She does hold persecutory ideation about her health condition. However, due to the confirmed presence of advanced technology markers in her body and the confirmation that her body is receiving signals from an identifiable SCADA system, this ideation appears to be at least partially and potentially totally accurate negating its classification as paranoid. On the clinical rated dimensions of psychosis severity scale, impressions were as follows. Hallucinations not present, delusions not present, disorganized speech not present, abnormal psycho behavior, psychomotor behavior not present, negative symptoms not present, impaired cognition equivocal, depression not present, mania not present, equivocal rating, symptom severity insufficient to be considered psychosis for impaired cognition refers to cumulative effects of present reported illness. Um, and it goes on, uh, thought content um, was negative for suicidal ideation, intent and plan, and negative for homicidal ideation, intent and plan, fund of knowledge was excellent, impulse control is excellent, insight and judgment appear intact. Ms. Berner described the coping strategy she is using to deal with her unusual experiences in a straightforward and lucid manner. It reads further on page 17. During 2014, after living under the radar, Ms. Berner flew to Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, where she feels she was again detected by surveillance. Photos were obtained of Distrito Federal observing her movements. She was deliberately introduced to rabbit fever, also known as tularemia, while there and report in the, and the report indicates the timing was during her last day in Cabo. Dr. Hildegard Staniger pointed out these materials can be introduced by spraying to pillows, bedding, etc. Later in the year, she reported noticing Korean nationals following and monitoring her outside her home. She did not report any direct physical assaults, but mentioned frequent surveillance by Koreans in summer of 2014 with one incident where a Korean man came physically close in a threatening manner. She took pictures of this man and said she tracked his identity through her insider contacts. She was informed that this person came up as a hired assassin from North Korea and that the Department of Homeland Security was involved in this operation, evidence is obtained. She stated that she was told to pack up and leave when the unnamed insider confirmed that the Koreans appeared to be assassins and that leaving ASAP was imperative. Continuing events involving harassment and exposure to nanomaterials in 2015 are described in the history of the present illness. July of 2015, a legal notice of criminal activity by government officials and demand for action was witnessed by Dr. Hildegard Staniger. She says, after four years of tracking Ms. Bernor's history of repeated poisonings and non-consensual exposure to advanced nanomaterials, Dr. Staniger wrote an affidavit confirming her belief based upon her professional expertise that Ms. Bernor does appear to be the recipient of weaponized innovative technology in a manner which appears to indicate serious criminal activity. To the affiant's knowledge, there have been repeated attempts to murder Kiri Bernor, to maim, cause permanent loss of brain function, and to monitor her biological presence, genetics, and physiological functions via remote sources. Ms. Bernor flied, or filed her own affidavit to the same effect in July of 2015, including more than 700 pages of documents. She said she sent copies of this, et cetera, so I've already reviewed that with you. It, this report further states, uh, Ms. Ms. Berner stated, I feel the CIA is targeting me. Now this is going back to Dr. Benjamin Coldson's report. More accurately, St. Joseph's Abbey is targeting me through the CIA, the Vatican and the Jesuits. She asked why she feels she became targeted. She responded, I feel that it is possibly, possibly through my social activism. I started to expose sex abuse and then this became exposure of genocide hidden behind a cover aimed at Americans who are nationalists or libertarian, I exposed the Nazi paperclip origins of the founder of St. Joseph's Abbey. She described her photographic evidence of a commemorative altar at St. Joseph's Abbey memorializing the founder of J. Peter Grace and related historical details of the ties between, between W.R. Grace Company and support of Project Paperclip, which imported Nazi scientists and war criminals to the United States post-World War II. She said that the Abbey's photo of this commemorative altar was temporarily removed for about a month and then reduced in size so that his name is obscured on the altar from their website after she exposed this website. I mean, exposed this relationship. Now I have captured this photograph so you can see 
that this is the altar that's commemorating, let's see here, if I can get this um, down here. This is the altar commemorating J. Peter Grace, who's buried up at St. Joseph's Abbey alongside with his wife, Margaret. So I just wanted to show you that this is a true, you know, an accurate photograph of the altar that is there at St. Joseph's Abbey. Now, from here, what I'd like to do is just basically, you know, do a quick review of the timeline with the 10 attempts. We're not gonna go through all 10, but at least you have it for your record. So essentially in July of 2011, the sinus surgery, uh, during sinus surgery, an incision was made in jawline to insert hazardous materials, including dragon protein. The second attack was April, May of 2014, the rabbit fever attack in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. The third one was August 2014, sound weapons caused brain swelling six days or so of constant pain. Now I'm gonna to read to you from a report. I hired a security, um, I hired security and they actually were able to provide me with a report because I said I was in a lot of pain and I felt that some sort of weapon was being deployed but I had no way to, to prove that. So my security team did hire uh, an, an engineer a sound weapons engineer and this engineer created this um, this report and I'm only allowed to quote certain parts of it. Um, subjects address is confirmed to be targeted by multiple frequencies combined within a complex combination of delivery waveforms. The waveforms targeting the area are both HIFU and LFU that appear to be modulated to deliver some form of data as the packets that are encoded in the modulation are sweeping across frequencies and repeat at regular intervals. It is my assertion that there is some sort of message being delivered. However, I personally experienced the pain, anxiety, and paranoia associated with the delivery at the target site. In my professional experience, those feelings are the simplest form of torture associated with these sorts of weapons. I do contend the use of a weapon in this case. It says further, it is essentially impossible to claim the existence of the observed frequencies and waves to be an anomalous event or by accident. It is my opinion that the observed phenomena is purposely deployed. Then he gets into the megahertz, the kilohertz, and important here for transcranial pulses to pass to the brain tissue. And he says with the kilohertz, this was a puzzling frequency set. I observed it present in every reading. After thinking about it, this is similar range for LRAD use. And yes, this was extremely painful. My brain was extremely swollen. Um, so then we have late August 2014, Korean followed me and monitored me outside my home. I was told to pack up and leave immediately and that there had been four other people on the same SCADA network who had been killed that week. An audio of Dr. Hildegard Scanniger and the insider with clearance who shall re remain unnamed in this report confirmed that the Koreans appeared to be assassins and that leaving ASAP was imperative. If the data is required of the IT for the INTJ, I'm more than happy to supply that. The February 2015 is the car interior was sprayed with smart dust, confirmed with patch test, et cetera. May of 2015, my friend Mark Ellis's car that I used to escape on the 28th was sprayed with, with smart dust. Navy tagged vehicles followed me north. Uh, my escape was prompted by what appeared to be an AR-15 with a 100-round clip behind my trash bin. I felt it was a psychological operation, and when I sent the photographs over to another DOD agent who had a clearance, he said he felt it was Jade Helm, and I'll show you the photograph. And I saw uh, when, I, when there was a knock at my door, I ran straight to my closet, and my closet had all the cameras so I could see all the way around the house. And this is what appeared behind my trash bin. So to me, that, that looked dangerous. And my, um, my counselors told me to pack up and leave. So I did. Then in March, 2016, an order of play was shipped around March 7, 2016. Now this is where it gets interesting. At the time, the Abbey, St. Joseph's Abbey, alleged via their attorney, Timothy Wickstrom, to want to meet and settle my claims. I was using clay to remove radiation from the previous Navy nano attack 
again, all evidence is obtained to evidence the, the presence of nanotech, but this batch didn't feel right. Upon testing it, it was found to have iridotoxin and smart dust. I was infected again. Uh, documents for Navy patents and photomicrographs tied to nano in my body are in my affidavit notice to the world. In August 2016, I was attacked by nano dispersal in my hotel room for a color therapy conference in Miami, Florida. November 2016, I received a seven days to die message via email. And in December 2016, uh, nano aerosol dispersal by way of uh, NAV over my dwelling in Florida. So this is just to give the big picture of what was going on. Now, what I want to do is show you that during the year of 2016, I had reached out to an attorney and the attorney, seeing that my claims were substantial, uh, initiated communication with St. Joseph's Abbey. This was on or about February 23, 2016. And this is my communication um, from the attorney, Robert Gray. Sorry about the uh, photograph. Okay. So Robert Gray actually wrote, oh, is this? Yeah, that's Robert Gray and Associates at the top. So basically, we reached out to the Abbey and we wrote to them, Dear President, President Damien Carr et al., I'll be calling the Abbey on Wednesday, March 23rd, 2016 at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the purpose of initiating negotiations to settle claims of Sister Kiri Bruner against the Abbey and all many other players who have had a part in damaging her. I ask that you have your legal counsel, if any, present for the call. I'm also inviting the Pope or His Holiness's em emissary to join us. This notice is going to His Holiness by way of International Express Mail. If you have inside channels that would ensure he receives notice timely, please access those for this matter. If the above time is not convenient, please offer times more conducive to your needs. We will do our best to accommodate Robert Gray attorney. Uh, carbon copy to Pope Francis. This one also the same in like manner went to Fordham University and 16 other parties for a claim of 241 million uh, each. Then I wrote to the Vatican and tried to create resolutions for peace for requests for settlement discussions. I tried to be peaceful about all of this and I continued to get attack after attack. And then my attorneys ended up uh, experiencing uh, getting beat to the point where their spinal column was nearly severed the other attorneys ended up getting either sick or family members were threatened and just a bunch of other complications. So that's just to illustrate the strangeness of all of that. Now, another thing that was interesting is at the time, um, the time at which I started to reach out for legal help, I noticed that there was the Rockefellers were looking on my website and it was right around the exact time that, I need, I need the other side of that, the other side, the other side. Here it is. It's Rockefeller Group Technology Solutions. This is 23 March. This was right around the five week time that Timothy Wickstrom said, that's the Abbey's attorney, said that they wanted to have a meeting with us. So. Interestingly, this is them looking on my website and they're looking up the page, who is J. Peter Grace? Well, if you do more research, you find that J. Peter Grace and the Rockefellers worked hand in glove together. So obviously the Abbey has handlers and their handlers did not want us to settle um, peacefully. So uh, here's, okay, so when I saw, uh, the connection between my past with St. Joseph's Abbey and the case relating to it, I recognize the efforts to kill me were related to them and their handlers. The Abbey does not refute this. The law in Massachusetts extended the statute of limitations to 15 years for sex abuse cases involving clergy. So up until 23 August of 2016, I would have by law been able to sue them. I was seeking to bring resolution to the Abbey at L, but there were further attempts on my life after those overtures were made, then I realized their handlers, the Jesuits and the CIA did not want me to settle with them. I chose to fire all attorneys or release them from any obligations when they came under threat, either physically or through family members or other means for helping me. 
I realized some, not all monks, are indeed covers for a CIA front. The records show the historical beginnings of their monastery pointing to the establishment of this abbey in the 1950s for specific strategic purposes unrelated to the monastic life. See document called CIA run monastery relentless in efforts to silence whistleblower nun with date 19 May 2016 evidence was provided to the ITNJ. And I'm going to look through here. Part of the article featured a, a clipping and the clipping was from a um, a photograph of a video called Always in His Presence that St. Joseph's Abbey um, created so that they could um, inspire people to, to join the religious life with them. Well, in the sequence, I found that there's a monk doing fake experiments on a, you know, over here, hopefully that shows in the camera. Sorry about that. And the monk is actually wearing a Rolex, which is an $8,000 watch. So I took that and when I went back to revisit the In His Presence video, that sequence was completely removed. Further, the Collinson Report reads, prior psychiatric history, bottom line, I had post-traumatic stress disorder, which was triggered by uh, the St. Joseph's Abbey matter not doing the right thing to resolve the, the issue. All I wanted from them was to have them remove Father Joseph Chukong from ministry from women. I didn't want to get any finances. I wanted nothing to do with money. I just wanted them to do the right thing. So I couldn't understand why they wouldn't just do the right thing. Um, then it says further. Summary. SCADA systems are known to be able to produce consciousness altering remote effects as well as many other physiological and neurological effects. Given the validated presence of such advanced nanotechnological devices in monitoring activating frequencies detectable from her physical form, it is difficult to escape the conclusion that Ms. Bruno's report of her experience is in fact quite accurate and not delusional regarding remote external influences affecting her health. It does appear from review of verifiable evidence that she has been subjected to direct, directed energy influences surveillance and poisonings with highly toxic materials since reported 2011 onset of symptoms. Ms. Berner's statements that St. Joseph's Abbey refused to recognize her initial charge of sexual abuse by Father Joseph Chukong and control the court verdict by negating this a charge through suppression of evidence also appears well documented. Her work following this outcome on behalf of other survivors of clergy abuse contributed significantly to the exposure of globally widespread abuse by clergy and a pattern of an action by church authorities. This exposure of church policy was made publicly famous in the Academy Award-winning movie Spotlight. Ms. Bernor's efforts to tell the truth when extremely difficult to do so speaks highly of her moral character. Her statements regarding widespread complicity of the Jesuit order and massive, massive global conspiracy are a matter for legal experts to pass judgment on. Her arguments are well-documented and historically referenced and do not appear to be irrational or delusional. And it goes on with very nice things that he's saying about me. Uh, she appears to be coping with stressors adequately. Her pragmatic approach to developing evidence has in fact produced results which confirm a physical basis exists that support her claims regarding her personal health. Ms. Bernard does not appear to be danger to herself or others and her thought process and general demeanor indicates she's dealing with her unusual situation rationally. Conclusions. Extreme chronic exposure to traumatic events. This doctor was actually threatened, so he had to change it from diagnosis to conclusions because they threatened him for making any diagnostic uh, findings. But he says further here, there is no diagnostic category in the DSMV Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that accurately describes neurological, physiological, psychological disruption and or impairment subsequent to continuous exposure to external influences of the nature described herein. Ms. Bernard does appear to have been linked to an externally operated SCADA system for reasons unknown. In this situation, her full and complete diagnosis lies somewhere outside the boundaries of the categories defined by the DSMV and current psychiatric convention. Further evaluators of her condition need to access Ms. Bernard's complete medical records, including H. SCADA analysis test results, to avoid the mistake of categorizing her experience as the result of delusional thinking. Please see PowerPoint, uh, now it's a video on YouTube, Jesus Defeats Nanotechnology Weapons, a synopsis and pictures of my triumph over this deadly technology, also provided to the ITNJ. 
I've experienced a measurable loss of privacy, loss of health, loss of civil and other rights, loss of safety, interceptions of all communications, electronic, oral, written, and otherwise, terroristic acts, abuse as a chemical and biological experiment, torture, cruel and inhumane treatment, hate crimes, discrimination, retaliation, isolation, irreparable loss of time with family and friends, conspiracy against my rights and against the people of the United States of America, gang stalking, harassment, electronic harassment, theft and obstruction of my mail and correspondences, tortious interference with contractual relations and tortious interference with prospective advantage, identity theft, weapons of mass destruction, destruction of motor vehicle being the intended target of murder, living like a fugitive undercover in my own country for five and a half years, financial distress and permanent effects on my health. Remedies and solutions. I was invited to approach Daniel P. Sheehan, who is an attorney that worked with survivors of these nano weapons who has successfully been able to reach settlements in cases like mine. In one such case that was brought to my attention, the client settled for 100 million US dollars with the stipulation that they not disclose any aspects of the case whatsoever to anyone. I looked into Daniel P. Sheehan and this is what I found. On his website, danielpsheehan.com backslash about, open quote, Dan became a candidate for the Jesuit priesthood and served as general counsel to the United States Jesuit headquarters in Washington, D.C. for 10 years, where he also served as the co-director of the American Jesuit Order's National Office of Social Ministry. When I exposed this, I was again attacked with lethal nano weapons. And if, if someone doesn't know that weapons are, uh, nanotechnology is a weapon, I've heard some people in the intelligence community try to tell me that. There is a document that's wonderful. It's called Nanotechnology and the International Law of Weaponry Towards International Regulation of Nano Weapons, Hitoshi Nasu and Thomas Fonts, Journal of Law, Information and Science, Volume 20, 2009, 2010, also provided to the ITNJ. This time, when I was at Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, the attack came in the form of tularemia, also known as rabbit fever, when in fact I was not near any remote thing wherein I could have contracted that disease. So needless to say, I did not pursue Daniel P. Sheehan, the Jesuit, for any remedy. And I'm not saying this man is evil, I'm just saying that I couldn't pursue him, it's a conflict of interest. At this point, I realized I was a spot on with identifying the Jesuits and their ties to nanotechnology. So I posted a YouTube video which was, has been since removed and can no longer be found with a PowerPoint called Nanotechnology, Ultimate Weapon of War of the Military Company of the Society of Jesus, AKA the Jesuits, in reducing the peoples and governments of all nations to the secular political temporal power of the Pope of Rome. Copyright 2014, Nanotruth Ministries, all rights reserved. God has allowed me to continue to be here in this world and I believe there are many remedies we as mankind can implement to bring this diabolical design and worldwide pillage to an end. All of mankind has been selected and targeted for hybridization as was done to each and every one of us who has a birth certificate. We all became wedded to and presumed surety for this entity, whether we know it or not. On March 6, this is in American law, by the way, uh, 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued Proclamation 2039 invoking emergency war powers. Three days later on March 9, 1933, the Emergency Banking Relief Act was passed taking an old World War I statute of 1917 called Trading with the Enemy Act and amending it to say, all persons within the United States are now enemies of the de facto military government. Roosevelt becomes the Augustus Caesar converting the constitutional 14th Amendment American Republic into a de facto American empire. At this time, the American conqueror seizes all registered property on a state level as the booty of war. This includes all real property, all corporations and artificial persons deemed US citizens, given a name of war, also known as nom de guerre, which was created on a state level by means of a publicly filed certificate of live birth. Every natural person being an American citizen of the United States has also been seized as he is surety for his US citizen to which he is hybridized and attached. I was impressed with just how critical uh, crucial it is to become a private citizen when my friend, who is a daughter of a CIA agent, said that her dad told her, if you ever get pulled over by police, you must tell them you're a private citizen. I did not know the way to get this accomplished, and so I had no time to pursue it. I asked my class if anyone would be willing to look into this further and to get to the truth 
to get to the truth. And he took on the challenge. Brother Eric John Phelps took on the challenge. He not only discovered what happened to all of us, he also found a way to reverse engineer the system set in place by a Jesuit takeover of our judicial systems for the purposes of taking our freedoms by adhesion contracts to see an operation of law. Phelps has acquired his rightful status back as non-enemy, non-US citizen, and he's paved the way for us to return to being pre-March 9, 1933 private citizens, the status we had at birth on the land as the, as the creator sees us. Now I'm just gonna show you his decree to show you it was done. And I'm not gonna say that it's required everyone should have a decree. The point of this is just to show that it can be done and it's merely, it's merely, you know, what one, what one would, uh, how one carries themselves that really gets them their remedy. But this is basically Eric Phelps, the upper lowercase name, and his all caps name, which was in, turned into a private business trust. And so he has the decree signed in the Court of Common Pleas of Lebanon County. Commonwealth of Massachusetts in equity, signed by Samuel A. Klein Judge. So this is just all good stuff to give hope, to show that there is a hope and a way out of these adhesion contracts. The problem we run into is enforceability of our rights. I believe since Donald J. Trump, I understand he's only one man, but his coming into office has given me and many others tremendous hope, has been in office that the rule of law is in fact returning. It is clear that the deep state and other imposters do not want this and won't go down without one hell of a fight. I share this without receiving any personal financial benefit and just to encourage you that momentum and a great awakening of our world is indeed taking place currently at an immense speed. The Jesuit connection in my situation is best told by Dr. Hildegard Staninger in her legal notice of criminal activity by government officials and demand for action by the witness and victim dated July 3rd, 2015, with nine pages and accompanying documents. Also known as Exhibit JJ to Bernard's legal notice to the world. Here on pages four and five, Dr. Staninger says, open quote, Kira Berner was perfectly clear of this technology and since recent tests of porphyrins, other pet tests pending as of this date of the affidavit, has returned to show presence of specific nanotechnology composed of hexagonal carboxyls that are specifically used to make porphyrin nanotubes used in the hexagonal wa waveguides as reported in phase one, et cetera. Advanced resonance analysis report special request analysis dated June 6, 2015 were reintroduced back into her system that she never gave permission for this, that the use of it was for torture, terrorism, and hate crime reasons against her due to Kiri Berner's unswerving faith in Christ without adherence to the Catholic faith tenets recent conversion to 2008 to orthodoxy, a heretical act as defined by the Roman Catholic dogmas, specifically extra ecclesium nulla salus, outside of the church there is no salvation, and as a means of, that's my insertion into there by the way, and as a means of retaliation by those she witnessed against in a criminal trial in 2003 against the priests of the Cistercian order in the Catholic church. The earmarks of Jesuit attack are also seen in that Fordham University pioneered the use of nanotechnology and is one of the leading authorities on the subject. According to Kiri Berner's testimony, transcripts of the trial case number, etc., Commonwealth versus Joseph Chukong, both priests who testified against her were graduates, affiliates, or professors at Fordham University. Affiant heard Kiri Berner mentioning her concern that this St. Joseph's Abbey in Spencer, Massachusetts was involved and that this same abbey had a founder by the name of J. Peter Grace, who is also known as one of the leaders involved in Project Paperclip, an operation that furnished a way to assist German doctors of the Third Reich evade the Nuremberg trials while also assisting with protecting those involved in mind control experiments. German scientists in 1934 developed nanotechnology as microbeads and other related technologies as stated in the book Nanotechnology, a gentle introduction to the next big idea by, by Mark Ratner and Daniel Ratner, Prentice Hall, New Jersey, uh, copyright 2003. Affian believes Kiri Berner to be of sound mind and that her con concerns are legitimate. Affian has personally seen the Department of Homeland Security monitoring meetings outside the building when Kiri Berner was present with Affian on Saturday, December 7, 2013. Now I'm going back to me here. I hereby give notice again that I do not promote prejudicing or hating Roman Catholics. Many Roman Catholics are loving, generous souls and have little knowledge of what goes on behind the scenes within the church. 
Yet many are growing to understand these days that their hierarchy has let them down. Roman Catholics are already part of the solution and many have faithfully helped me in my sufferings at the hand of this beast. See book called Windswept House by Father Malachi Martin who reveals that Satanism governs the Vatican political system. I do agree with and promote the enforcement of the Logan Act for all foreign agents of a foreign potentate that they should register if they are to live in this country so the United States of America's interests can be honored and protected from the Vatican's unholy policies. I hold that there needs to be a resurgence of the spirit of Pope Clement XIV who expelled the Jesuits and permanently suppressed the Jesuit order on July 21st, 1773 until he was subsequently poisoned by the Jesuits and this was reversed. Uh, see Federal Observer's publication, Burn or Counterpoint to the Catholic Church, October 3rd, 2008. And you can reference this at your own pleasure, U.S. Code Title 18, Part 1, Chapter 45, Subsection 953, for the definition of the, um, the Logan Act. I became aware that I was the carrier of knowledge to a remedy and that the deep state and the traitors to our nation wanted to suppress since nanoweapons were their prized mechanism to forth our force others to act in accordance with the unfolding of their agenda. It has been used to threaten and blackmail the Congress and such represents a threat to national security. I believe Trump is using executive powers to make things right as it appears that only the executive branch is in operation and that the other branches of our government are crippled. President Trump's executive order of December 21st, 2017, executive order blocking the property of persons involved in serious human rights abuse or corruption includes this matter. The agenda of the Jesuits is clearly to destroy all that is left of mankind and this earth. I exposed Nano Domestic Quell, which is a program deployed by the US Department of Defense under previous administrations, namely Obama, uh, designed to fulfill the ultimate hybridization concept, not only on paper, but now in mankind's very own flesh and blood through the introduction of nanotechnology to mankind's biological systems, disrupting mankind's genetics via foods, waters, vaccines, and geoengineering for future activation. And now I'm gonna read from the nano domestic quell documents. These doc documents were obtained from Dr. William uh, Bill Weld's website then later, someone with the Department of Defense clearance sent it to me. And so this is why I believe th this document is in fact valid. The document is June 2013, DTFN estimates for nano domestic quell phase four updated compliance. And I'll show you this part first. Now I can't get in trouble for showing these because this was open source and it was on the internet. And I took it down from the internet before they shut down this man's website. And then I'm going to read from this page here, Nano Domestic Quell. I'm going to read this for you into the record. This is a threat against all mankind, not just America, but this document is specifically addressed to Nano Domestic Quell for the U.S. population. Sorry, who's that, who's that document from? This document was obtained from Bill Weld's website, which I have references to that up here. No, that's fine. Uh, and, and if you just say again, would it, would it be important? Sure. sure. This document here is Nano Domestic Quell. And basically what it is, is a, it's an eyes only document that was released, approved for release somewhere in 2013. And here the document reads as follows. It's Domestic Quell. So it's for, it's, you know, this is basically the utilization of nanotechnology in foods and water supplies, etc. Here it reads. Who generated National... the document? Sorry, Sorry, who generated the document? How did, how did I generate the document? Uh, who originally generated it? I mean, it? Allegedly the Department of Defense, and I believe it is because a man with a clearance gave it to me. That's U.S. Defense? That's correct. Okay, correct. Okay, so National Nano Domestic Quell NDQ protocols for phase four, DTFN estimated rates in phase four updated compliance for NDQ. Current total infection rates for United States general population is at 87.2%. Projected infection for general US populace by January 2014 is estimated to reach 98%. 
Total infection for ages 18 and above may reach 99%. DTFN projects dispersal mediums will require additional resources for phase four of nano domestic quell. DTFN recommends an increase in the following medium inflows and outflows in specific to liquid dispersal. Pepsi-Cola, 9.9%. Nestle ADR, 8.5%. Chicago Municipal, 5.1%. Atlanta Municipal, 4.4%. Danone, 4.2%. Coca-Cola, 4.1%. Los Angeles Municipal, 2.9%. Seattle Municipal, 1%. Dispersal outflows have shown significant improvement in population infection rates. Shown significant improvement in population infection rates. Recommended inflow increases deployed in October 2012 resulted in a net increase of infection rates by 0.82%, slightly exceeding projections. DTFN assures DOD compliance for phase four will be completed one week ahead of schedule. No further recommendations have been submitted by DTFN for phase five. An expected update to outflow estimated rates will be forthcoming before phase five initialization. So obviously this is a threat. So uh, just, just coming in again, um, will we be hearing from the person that produced that document to you? I can ask him. Thank I can you. ask. Because the, the evidence that we have here has to be obviously from you. Mm -hmm. And so that document, because it wasn't actually from you, uh, put together by you, well, you understand what I'm saying. So um, it, it's helpful if in terms of your testimony, it's to the best of your knowledge, not someone else's. Ah, I see. Perfect. Okay. okay. Sure. All right. Please carry on. Thank you. Um, okay. I wish to commemorate and thank those who have given their lives in defense of the truth and who continue to be in the line of duty for my safety so that I am able to get this message out to you today. The sacrifices made by these souls will never go unnoticed in the court of heaven and within my own heart. They know who they are. There are people who hid me when I was on the run and living under different aliases, friends who might not have understood the entirety of what I was going through, but who trusted me anyway. Those seeking to help many in situations like mine, those who have suffered tremendous financial harm or threats or loss, to loss of credentials as a result of standing with me, those whose prayers are continually offered, those who have nurtured me, friends all over the world and family, and those in the TI and wider community who helped me with radio interviews, donations, and a kind word who reminded me of who I am in Christ. I thank God for his hand on my life and for his faithfulness. I thank you, President Donald J. Trump, and those many who are loyal to our country and to the Constitution of the United States of America and to the world for all that you are doing to help mankind get back in alignment with what is good, beautiful, and life-giving. I thank you, the editor of all my writings who stuck with me the entire way through, and for those who assist me with utmost faithfulness in keeping my identity safe when it was needed. I thank this commission for the work you continue to do and the survivors of unspeakable atrocities who have come forward and for, for those survivors who have not yet come forward, who have not yet come forward, who are fighting the effects of these invasive technologies. This gave me courage to tell my story today. May God bless each and every one of you. I pray my suffering and the lessons it brings may be of help to all mankind. I pray that by God's grace, the greatest legacy I leave is the seed of hope in the face of this kind of attack. Jesus Christ can heal anything. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Further affiant saith not. Carrie, thank you very, very much. Um, one cannot be failed to be impressed by the detail um, and with the authority and the directness with which you've given your evidence. So we're very obliged for that. Um, we will have a few more questions if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So just, just some of those questions are just dealing with clarity. Um, and some of the stuff that you're very, very familiar with, some people listening may not be as familiar as you, obviously. Yeah. Um, and so I'm going to go back through a little bit of uh, some of the historic stuff. So just, just for the record, what exactly was Operation Paperclip? The way I understand it is that there were German scientists 
who were brought over to the United States and other countries like Argentina. And they were basically protected uh, and, and were being utilized by our government. And some people make arguments to say that it really wasn't our government that was doing this, okay? But it was, it was the deep state or others, okay? And so the way I understand it is they were evading the Nuremberg trials. They were evading facing, you know, the crimes that they've done against humanity. And so these people were held in safe houses here in the United States in particular. That's where J. Peter Grace comes in. J. Peter Grace was involved in that um, effort. And he, and he was, uh, whether by the government or um, by the deep, uh, deep state or whatever, he was clearly a position in a position of authority that assisted with uh, Operation Paperclip. Yes, there are classified documents and declassified that you can read that would make the connections very clear. But also a really good book actually is by a Stephen Michaud and a Hugh, Hugh Ainsworth. It's called, If You Love Me, You Will Do My Will. And it describes the St. Joseph's Abbey and, and big oil and the relationship of a monk uh, who was, was working together very closely with an elderly woman in hopes that he would receive, you know, for the Abbey, her estate upon her death. So the relationship between J. Peter Grace, Cardinal Spellman, uh, the, you know, all of the players is actually outlined very well in that book. In, it was probably in the 70s. And your relationship with St. Joseph's Abbey was, you were none but. Yes, I was counseled by uh, the monks there in, in pursuit for two and a half years. I was counseled there to pursue the canonical um, hermit life. And in order to do that, you have to live the life, but you also have to have spiritual direction or accompaniment. And so because I was seeking the Cistercian spirituality, I had to seek out Cistercian counsel. If I wanted to be a Franciscan or Dominican in like kind, I would be pursuing those spiritual paths, Brilliant. teachers. And um, just something that you did note there, that was, was a gentleman that appeared to be wearing a, a, a Rolex watch. Um, you felt that that would be unusual for a priest. Are you aware of any professions where that would be quite usual? Um, there are other priests, you know, um, organizations that don't require a vow of poverty. So, <laughs> You know, in those cases, that would be typical, but the Cistercians have a vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience to, and the fourth vow is stability to the place so that they stay at the same monastery until their death. So they're not going all over the place because they're supposed to be amatores loci, a lover of the place. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, very good, very good. It's just um, obviously that uh, Rolex is well known for, for use by Secret Service. Um, so just put that. And then the last point is in regard to North Korea, and um, I think, uh, but, but please clarify this, um, North Korea and um, its potential relationship with Homeland Security, was that something I misunderstood? No, you're correct. What, what, do you want to speak to that or do you want to leave that? Uh, I, can, I can tell you I have a recording of the the DOD agent who had a meeting with Homeland Security, that they, he was chained to a chair for four hours. And this was somebody that I had hired, you know, to protect me, you know, namely to watch out after me and see what was happening. He was okay. questioned and I asked him, because the first person he called when he, he left that meeting was me. And I said, I'm really sorry, but I have a feeling that this meeting with Homeland Security was involving me. And he said, you're absolutely right, because when they were asking me about you, they didn't use your name, but there was a file on the table. And the file contained photographs of you traveling through the tunnel to, from Ohio to Pennsylvania. And it had your, um, your Apple devices, your phone numbers, and the reason he would know that is because I had to give him all of my communications equipment in exchange for equipment that I could use that wouldn't be traceable when I was on the run. 
So he said, yeah, you were identified here. And when he walked, when he went into the meeting, he saw a, a Korean gentleman there who's dressed in civilian clothes, no badge. And he stood up and said, you need to leave this room. We're gonna speak about matters of national security and Homeland Security. The agent looked at him and said, he's here. This isn't about him. This is about you sit down. And so, so basically I have evidence and recordings of all of these things because there would be no way to believe such a story unless I had evidence. Very true. And um, are you aware at all of the connection between uh, rare earth in North Korea and um, nanotechnology? Yes, that they use those uh, elements, the rare earth for the components to building, yes. So then um, before I give it over to, to, to the floor, um, just a couple more questions. You, you said before that uh, you, you became a nun. Why, why did you become a nun? I felt the calling. Um, way back when I was nine years old, I didn't know who God was. And so I asked God, I said, well, whoever you are, I need you to show me who you are. Because if I pray to Buddha, I don't want Allah to get mad. If I pray to Allah, I don't want Jesus to throw tomatoes at me. So I said, I need to know who you are. So in and out of sleep, or as they say, in the body or out of the body, we don't know. But in and out of sleep, I, I came out of this vision and the experience was, and I didn't study, I didn't know anything, I was only nine years old. And we were brought up as Protestant, but again, we weren't schooled in any, any uh, regular belief system, nothing like that. So I was underground where Jesus was tied up, you know, tied to this floor with chains, and he was gonna be crucified the following day. So I said, you're gonna be crucified tomorrow, I could help you get out of here. <laughs> and uh, I said, you can come, you need to come with me. And so I went and I touched his leg and I was like, wow, oh my God, this is God. I just knew it just from touching him. And from that experience on, when I was nine, I said, whoever that is, I want that. I want to marry that person. And ever since then, I've been, I have remained with my vow to him. Okay. So thanks very much for that. You also mentioned, though, that you went through quite a chronic family disturbances as well. Was they around that same period of time or were they after? Uh, could you repeat that? Uh, you said, or, or I, I don't think it was actually you that said it, but uh, it was in one of the reports that said that there had been some chronic family disturbance. Yes, yes. I, we grew up in an unstable home, uh, a, a father that wasn't present. Um, he left what, when I was probably two years old. Um, so my mother did the best she could to raise three kids all by herself. So it's only natural uh, that she had her own struggles too, of course. I believe it's a family curse and that we have to heal that line. So in the book, Divine Challenge, it gets into all of the juicy, you know, upbringing, you know, stuff with pictures of me and my twin sister and my brother. And so, yes, definitely there was neglect involved, alcoholism, et cetera. Okay. So, uh, okay, well, that, that makes sense as well. But then you chose to become a computer programming architect. Or well, what um, that's a, quite a turn, wasn't it? A program architect in the sense of not computer program, but I actually designed a program for others in my situation to be able to reverse engineer what's happening to them to be free of the nanotech attacks or of the other kind of attacks, like my uncle, for instance, who you've met. Very good, very good. Okay, so that's very helpful. Um, I'm now going to turn to Commissioner Kareen. Uh, Commissioner Kareen, have you any questions? Yeah, maybe it's a stupid question, but uh, Carrie, how do you pay all this? There are hundreds of thousands of people in your situation, uh, and, and they have not the source to pay for good lawyers, for people who are risking their lives. Um, so, and they are, they are very expensive. So how do you do this? Okay, that's a very good question. It's, I spent over $400,000 to stay alive from 2011 up until now, probably it's more than that now. But basically what I had to do is I had to create several aliases and- It's four o'clock. And I basically, um, I worked with, a former IRS agent 
who was in criminal investigations for over, I think it was 22 years. So at that point, because he was retired, he still was working as an enrolled agent. So I purchased the book. It's a $500 book. And I did consulting with him. I did other legal mm. remedies to help people get out of jail or to, to stay off the IRS until we could figure out how to bring a solution to them. Um, so I've consulted in many different areas. And because I was on the run, because I had to use several different aliases, I, try, I went to study um, GDD, um, color therapy, herbalism. I, had to, I, I was a consultant for that. So how did I do it? Frankly, to be on the run and have to pay taxes, that's very difficult because the IRS could track you. And once you're found, you, it's, it's not a good thing. So for me, I opened, I sat and I read the, the IRS code that had something to do with ministries. And I developed my own proprietary way to be able to have a private special account with and, and create a ministry. And the ministry is not taxable. So therefore it would be harder to trace. Okay. So I've been, I was opening trusts for people, helping, helping others with ministries. I mean, the, there's a long laundry list of it. So yes, it's, it is very tricky to, to navigate all of that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good because uh, thanks to the work, thanks to the, the work you've done, a, a lot of people, I suppose, you wrote books about it, no? I wrote okay. one book about my history from childhood until 2008, but I'm working on currently designing a teacher's manual so I could teach others to do what I do. So it's not just me and my team, because there's many people that are suffering from this. Uh, sure, I know. There was something else that stuck, struck me uh, in the picture, where the picture you showed with yourself as a nun. I had the impression there was a triangle a sticker on your front, the front of your head, or, or was this just shadow? It probably was shadow. I apologize for the quality of the picture. Um, let's see. Aha, let's pull this out. All righty. It could have been just because the flash, it could have been like the light arrangement. Um, let me see here. Is that any better? It's probably just from the way the light hit the flash. It's strange because it's really this. Huh. It's strange. Don't you see it on the picture? It's yeah. as if your, your third eye has been covered. Hmm. Don't you see this? Well, I, I, I would tell you at this time, it was very difficult. There's no doubt about it. I was definitely, I think this was after the event. I think this was after the event happened to me where the priest grabbed my chest. So yeah, that would make sense if someone was, um, strange. it's very clear to me when you show it, it's very yeah. clear. Um, uh, wait a minute. I have another. So again, there are the churches involved. It doesn't matter under what name, but the church is the only world spanning criminal organization on our planet. And Jesuits have been thrown out of the US before. Mm, that's They're right. all back, apparently. Um, wait a minute. Yeah, the, 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 the the advantage of these churches are also that they just change their names as we change our underwear. Right. Um, and they can travel free all over the world. Mm -hmm. It makes it quite easy to spread their uh, satanic messages, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I... But we I've, can't even say they are above the law. For them, there are no laws. They believe that we are their property. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, very sad. But you did a tremendous work on all this. My God. Dangerous, but uh, very, very useful. I wonder if, if you should not have contact with our previous um, uh, test testimony you just had um, with Mariana. I think you could help her get free of all these things in her body. We just heard her testimony. Maybe you have to, to discuss this with Connie. 
Uh, so Connie can ask uh, Mariana if she can give her email to you and please help her. She is, she is in a tremendous state. I can, what I'll do is I'll give the information to Connie and there's a specific procedure that they have to follow first. And once yeah. I get the two page summary and all of it, we have a nice little process. So it's not, mm -hmm. it keeps it simple and not overwhelming for them. So I'll send that information over. Yeah, maybe she can contact you because we have to, we have to help each other. Absolutely. Wh wherever we can. I think she, she can benefit tremendously from uh, your knowledge in this and to set her free from, from the horror she's still going through. So let's, uh, let's help uh, each other also and, and put the contacts together. Mm -hmm. But that's our angel Connie who <laughs> can, can, can take care of that. Okay, I, I have no further questions. Thank you very much, Green. That's very kind. Uh, Commissioner Justin. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Kerry, I, I've really only got one question. Um, first of all, can I ask you, are you familiar with the Sabbatean Frankists? There's the 17 what? The Sabbatean, the Sabbatean Frankists. Oh, okay. I've heard of that, but I may not be very yeah. well versed. But go ahead. Well, we've only become familiar, I, my people <laughs> have only become familiar with it this year, actually, if I'm honest. And the one thing that we discovered is that they infiltrated the Vatican, they infiltrated Islam, and they, inter inf and they were Judea, well, they're false Jews, they're, they're not real Jews, but effectively they've spread poison, satanic poison, into the Judaism, into Islam, and into the Vatican. Now, I'm, I'm not a great expert here, but the... the, the the picture we're forming is you've got these rogue elements who all work together, the war and terror and everything else that is happening. Now, there are very good people, wonderful people in all these religions. There are wonderful people in Judaism, Islam, and in Christianity and the Vatican. The question I want to ask is, do you have, a? I mean, as, as the consciousness, as we're all waking up and we're waking up in all aspects, whether it's to do with money creation, um, you know, how they control us everywhere. You know, we look, we are waking up. At what level do you believe in the Vatican at high level? Are there bishops waking up? Are there people who can be trusted waking up? You know, at what, at what level do you think uh, it is a sensible way to say that these people now can be trusted, who will now start to question? Because we hear there's a black pope, a grey pope, a, a, you know, a white pope. We know the current Pope is a Jesuit. You know, is there a level of Roman Catholic faith now that can be trusted? I believe there is still. And particularly the testimony that was recently released by His Excellency Carlo Maria Vigano. He was the Apostolic Nuncio um, previously. He is writing a scathing dissent from uh, the current Pope's uh, activities or lack thereof for helping others and so you might want to I could send it to you I'm more than happy to but this yes is, I'd be very grateful for that yes I would he's he's yes, he I seems would. to be really true I mean this this is from his heart I had always believed in hope that the hierarchy of the church would find within itself the spiritual resources and strength to tell the whole truth to amend and renew itself that is why even though I had repeatedly been asked to do so, I always avoided making statements to the media, even when it would have been in my right to do so, in order to defend myself against the calumnies published against me, even by high-ranking prelates of the Roman Curia. And he goes on and on and says that under Obama's administration, there's a collusion going on between Cardinal Tarsicio, and he names them. And it's just, this is very powerful. So I'm more than happy to share that with you. Yes, I'd be grateful. That would be very helpful. And that's well, really yeah. all I've got. To say, but thank yeah. you very much and well done. And thank you. Yeah, I don't envy the position you find yourself in, but I would like just to say the cavalry is coming. Okay? <laughs> well, awesome. The cavalry is on its way. Justine, part of the cavalry. Justine, there is maybe a book that you should read too. And it's, uh, but it's in French or Italian. I don't know if it has been translated to English. But it was forbidden in Belgium to, to translate it to uh, Dutch. 
But the, the name of the book is Le Vatican Mi Anu uh, by two uh, cardinals within the Vatican who, the, who, um, who uh, witnessed satanic rituals with children in the Vatican. And uh, in fact, if you translate it, it is the Vatican um, uh, uh, put naked, okay, literally so re, re, uh, translated, yeah. uh, uh, undressed, yep. something like that, yeah. you know, uh, put in their nude. <laughs> uh, this, this too had to use another name, but uh, this this book ha there has been tremendous uh, pressure on it to to stop it from being diffused. I have it, so if somehow I can get it to you, but it's in French. But I'm sure we'll we'll do our best to discover exactly the way to get that over to 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 both you, Justin, and, and to you as well, Karen. Thank you. Um, just wrapping it up now. Um, so thank you again. Very very obliged for the testimony. Um, I'm sure that we're going to have another conversation, if not many more, with you. Uh, if that's okay. Oh, absolutely. Uh, excellent. Um, I love the way that you started that off with that love is the way out. And, and with those words, love is the way out. I think we'll find our way out. Thank you. Thank you all, all of you.